Welcome to this video on what is graphing. For most students, graphing is a situation that looks like this, where your teacher gives you an equation, and depending on what chapter or unit you're in, you use certain techniques that you've learned. For example, if you were at, in the middle of a graphing lines unit, your teacher may give you this problem and this would be the answer. And there'd be techniques they would give you to get there. That's not what this video is about. But you may be in the middle of a different unit in a different course, graphing parabolas, and your teacher gives you this equation and teaches you a strategy to end up with this picture. Or maybe you're in the middle of a conic section unit and your teacher gives you this graph and tells you why it's a circle and trains you to graph this particular circle here in this location and size. But there's nothing wrong with that inherently other than the fact that it sometimes makes us forget what does graphing actually mean? And that's what this video is about. Graphing is the marking on an XY axis of all the points that meet a certain condition. So for example, when we're told to graph X, e X squared equals Y squared, we want to find all points on the graph for which the X coordinate squared is equal to the Y coordinate squared. Now, most students, when they see this problem, the first thing they think is, what kind of problem am I, am I graphing? What chapter am I in? What are the latest techniques I've been taught? But we really want to think of graphing more broadly than that. So when you're told to graph x squared equals y squared, think of it as this statement. Those are really mean the same thing. One of them is just a shorter version of, than the other. But I don't want to forget what graphing means. So let's examine this particular problem. Here are my x and y axes. And I'm going to mark all the points that make this condition true, but not by using a technique, just by thinking. Trial and error can be a tremendous help in graphing. For example, I think we all agree that 3 squared equals 3 squared. 9 equals 9 after all, right? And so therefore, this graph, whatever it looks like, must contain the point 3, 3. We'll put that right here as usual. But isn't it also true that negative 2 squared equals negative 2 squared? Of course it is. 4 equals 4. We all know that. So I'm, I'm going to infer that this graph must contain the point negative 2, negative 2, and I'll mark that here on my graph. This is also a true statement. After all, 16 equals 16. We can't argue with that. Therefore, this graph should contain the point 4, negative 4, which we'll put here as usual. And of course, 0 squared equals 0 squared, so this graph must pa pass through or contain the origin 0, 0. But you, if you do this enough, by randomly choosing numbers that work for your equation, you'll eventually find a lot of them. You'll not only find a lot of them, but you'll start to see a pattern. And at some point, one has a realization like, hey, I know where all the points that meet this condition are. They all must lie in this section, on one of these two lines. And in some sense, this is the answer to this problem. Although I would take exception with the round dots that you see there. Students are often trained to make round dots to help them make a graph. And there's nothing wrong with that. I've done it here. But what students aren't trained to do typically, and I'm hoping to impress this upon you, is that those round dots that you see here are not special points on this graph. They're just examples of the infinitely many pairs of points for which x squared equals y squared. So we really ought not to have those points in our final answer because it draws undue attention to them as if they were somehow different or special in some way when they were really just points that led us to the generalization that any points on these two diagonal lines will satisfy this condition. And so in that sense, this is the graph of x squared equals y squared.
Now you probably will never learn this particular problem in a math class because it doesn't fit nicely into our categorization of shapes, the circle, the parabolas, the hyperbolas, and the lines, and all the things that we build our chapters around. But when we're in a math class, we can never forget that graphing is really just marking all points that meet a certain condition or make a certain statement true. Here's a different example. Sometimes graphs don't have the letter Y in them. They're expressed in function notation instead. For example, this one says F of X equals some formula. Now functions can have any name, F, G, H, K, whatever we wanna call them. But whatever letter we choose to call them, that letter represents our Y variable. So when we're asked to graph this, this is what's really being asked of us. We're asked to mark all the points X comma F of X. That probably looks pretty strange. What that means is we're supposed to mar mark all points on a graph that, that are input comma output for our particular function using all the X's that were allowed in the so-called domain, which is the set of allowable X's. So let's do this particular problem. Here's a graph. And I'm going to pick randomly an input of three just to see what happens here and prove a point that I'm trying to make about graphing functions. If three were an input here, the absolute value of three is three. And so the output of this function for that particular input would be six. So if the input is three and the output is six, then I'm being asked to mark the point three sixths on my graph. Let's look at another example. Let's use negative two as our input. The absolute value of negative two is positive two. And so the output here works out to be zero. So if negative two is my input and zero is my output, this graph should also contain negative two zero, which is right here. Now, I'm going to keep choosing somewhat random inputs until I think that I see some kind of pattern. At this point, many, many students that I've worked with would take those two points on the graph and connect them and say that it's a line, but not all graphs are linear. And there's no reason that we can assume that this one is. So I'm gonna choose another input. I'm gonna choose an input of one. The absolute value of one is one. So my output is two. So if the input is one and the output is two, this graph must contain one, two which is right here. And we can see already that this graph is nonlinear because those points don't line up. Graphs with absolute values in them tend to be nonlinear. Well, I still don't have a clear picture of where all of the points are. Look at the instructions in the upper right corner. I have to mark all the points. How am I gonna mark all of the points? Am I gonna just do this one problem for the rest of my life, picking random inputs until I have all of them? That's not practical, but of course I'm not gonna do that. But what will happen is if I pick a few more inputs, I'm gonna get a general trend that I recognize. And once I recognize that trend, then I'll know where the rest of the points are and I can stop picking examples. So I'm gonna choose negative five as my input. The absolute value of negative five is five. So my output works out to zero again. And if negative five is my input and my output is zero, then the graph should contain negative five zero. That's what I mean by graphing a function is about graphing all input output pairs, also known as X, Y pairs. So there's the point negative five zero. Let's do another point. If my input is zero, my output is zero. Therefore, this graph contains the origin, zero, zero. Now I'm starting to get an idea here, but let me do one more input just to solidify my idea. Let's use an input of two. With an input of two, we get an output of four. Hence the, the point two, four lies on this graph as well, and there it is. 
Now at this point, something has occurred to me. If I have a negative input, I'm always gonna get a zero answer. And if I have a positive output, input, sorry, if I have a positive input, then I'm always gonna get double that answer. So it occurs to me that I've done enough points here to see a trend and that this graph must be right there. Again, the six black dots or the round dots that you see here, those really don't belong on the graph. Now, if you did that, a teacher would give you credit, I'm sure, but it looks kind of suspicious or unusual because when those dots being there, it makes the reader think that there's something special about them in some way that they should stand out over all the other points that are on the, this graph. But since there's infinitely many points on this graph and there isn't anything particularly special about those six points, I think the graph looks better without them. And I hope in this video, I hope that you have got a better sense of what graphing actually is rather than just some procedure that you follow when you're told to do so. Thank you for watching.